Welcome to this Adam Smith Institute webinar. My name is Eamon Butler. Adam Smith, uh, the great philosopher and economist, was uh, raised by his widowed mother in Kirkcaldy on the east coast of Scotland. He showed a keen interest in books and learning, going on to Glasgow University and then to Oxford. Back in Scotland, he gave a successful series of public lectures before returning to Glasgow as a professor. Smith shot to fame in 1759 with his book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments. It argued that the foundation of morality was our natural empathy with others. On the strength of such innovative thinking, he was hired as personal tutor to a young Scottish aristocrat. And on the grand tour with that student, uh, Smith um, met many of the European, leading European thinkers of the day and started working on a new book, the Wealth of Nations. It was a broadside against onerous taxes and restrictions on trade and commerce. And that book secured his place as the father of liberal economics. That, of course, leaves him reviled today by anti-capitalists and others. And in addition, his statue and tomb in Edinburgh have been targeted by the cancelled culture, who argue that although Smith described slavery as brutal and inhumane, his main argument against it was economic. Well, with me to discuss Smith's legacy today are three Adam Smith experts. We have Jimena Hurtado, who is an economics professor at the Universidad de Dos Andes in uh, Colombia. And uh, she's written about Smith's view of human morality, identity, and community. Daniel B. Klein is Professor of Economics at George Mason University, who among other things has recently debunked the criticism of Adam Smith's views on slavery. And Craig Smith, no relation to the great man, uh, is the Adam Smith Senior lecture, Lecturer at the Scottish, uh, Scottish Enlightenment, sorry, he's the Adam Smith Senior Lecturer in Scottish Enlightenment at the University of Glasgow, uh, Smith's old university, and he's an expert on Smith's political thought. So turning first to you, uh, Jimena, uh, in an age of identity politics, what can Smith teach us about the morality and the social, social nature of human beings? So uh, thank you for having me today and organizing this webinar. I'm really happy to share the floor with Daniel and Craig. And um, let me start by saying, I think the interest of Adam Smith today is that he can still talk, we can still talk to him about contemporary issues uh, that have actually accompanied us throughout history and histories and on which we still have an ongoing and at times difficult conversation. What I find most compelling in Smith today is that rather than exploring this founding figure of modernity called the other, he set out to explore our extended selves, our social nature, uh, meaning that we are with others and how we are and learn to be humans in this connection with those around us. This does not mean that there is a fusion or that we become them. We learn to communicate, we to share and to discover what we might have in common and also to strengthen what makes us ourselves or what is unique about each one of us. So communication is fundamental, it's essential. The key word here I think is sympathy and it has been identified with empathy nowadays but in Smith actually it's a process. One that starts with seeing those around us, uh, so visibility, again, is crucial and depends on physical and psychological distance and leads to identification and recognition, but it does not necessarily lead to approval or integration. It is possible that the process might lead to exclusion also. And I think this is very powerful because it changes from the idea that this process or this affective communication leads to harmonious relationships or to homogeneous communities or that because we are empathic or even benevolent or just not selfish individuals, everything will go smoothly. 
Uh, Smith is no doubt optimistic about humans and our ability to build norms and institutions that will promote a just society, but he does not see, he does not cover the difficulties and the consequences, negative and positive, that some of those norms and institutions have had and might still have. And what he rather does is he calls upon his readers to push the analysis, to go further into the conversation, to acknowledge these advantages and the risks associated with these extended selves that form our identities and make us moral. If I could, if I could ask you then, um, so it's all about our individual identity. So Smith presumably would be rather shocked by the idea that individuals' morality uh, was limited by what group they happened to belong to. Um, but actually, so I think this, this is a possibility in Smith and it could be explained by the limits of the sympathetic process due precisely to what I mentioned earlier, that is visibility. So we cannot communicate with those we cannot see. And again, uh, visibility depends on physical and psychological distance. Smith specifically talks about the asymmetry of sympathy and explains that it is easier for humans to see and therefore to sympathize with those who are in better situations than ours, than our own, because it gives us pleasure actually. And it is hard to sympathize with the miserable, he calls them, those in situation of poverty or of oppression or unhappiness, because it is so hard we can even try not to see them. And this would lead to their exclusion. But it is this learning and uh, continuing to, in this construction of ourselves with others that he is trying to push to extend ourselves in that sense. So yes, you would be shocked, I think, if you just uh, stay within your comfort zone and your circle and you do not try to see and you make do not make the effort to see those who are not like you or what you think you are, because we're changing our identities all the time. We don't have a fixed identity either for Smith. For example, Smith gives us a, a case of a person that grows up, it's not, I could not call this a person actually, of a being that grows up outside of society. And uh, Smith states clearly that such a being would not actually be a human being because this person could, this being could not develop rules of conduct or any notion of good or bad and would therefore be an amoral being. So we are with others again, and those others, we have to see them and to be able to communicate with them in this permanent construction, constant, continuous constructions of ourselves. Mm, wow, uh, we'll, uh, we'll come back to, uh, to these issues, uh, but let me bring in uh, Daniel. Um, uh, Daniel, uh, Adam Smith is uh, criticized and um, uh, Smith's public monuments uh, in Edinburgh are uh, under scrutiny, possibly under threat, uh, because his main argument against slavery uh, was that it was economically inefficient. Um, or is this a gross misreading of what Smith was getting at? I don't know that I'd call it a gross misreading, but I would call it a misreading. His first and I think most powerful remarks, published remarks, were moral and very strong. I'd like to share them. It's two sentences. Um, they appeared in the original 1759 edition. I think it's one of the most moving passages in this great work, Theory of Moral Sentiments. The first sentence, there is not a Negro from the coast of Africa who does not in this respect possess a degree of magnanimity which the soul of his sordid master is too often scarce capable of conceiving. So he's speaking of a Negro from the coast of Africa. He's talking about people being enslaved in Africa. And the master here is the slaver. 
okay, which was operating from British ports at that time. So this was a really cheeky, I would say very outspoken thing in 1759. But the second sentence, I think is really something. It's a little longer. Fortune never exerted more cruelly her empire over mankind than when she subjected those nations of heroes to the refuse of the jails of Europe, to wretches who possess the virtues neither of the countries which they come from, nor of those which they go to, and whose levity, brutality, and baseness so justly expose them to the contempt of the vanquished. So it's a very strong, a super strong moral condemnation of the slavers and moral honoring and sympathy with the enslaved, with the, the oppressed. Notice how he speaks of their contempt for their vanquishers. And he, he says, this is so justly felt. So, you know, first of all, he's, he's elevating their dignity by saying that they feel contempt as they are being um, oppressed. And then he's endorsing that contempt fully. So his first striking treatment is strictly a moral condemnation. Uh, and it's very much along, I think, the lines that Jimena was saying about a universality in, in human beings. We all naturally find our connections to other people through communication and sympathy uh, and build identities. But there is a universality to human beings from society, as Jimena was saying, um, that he was you know, fully accentuating and endorsing. He does in the in in the wealth of nations uh speak more about the economic failures of slavery the economic inefficiencies uh, he does speak about the uh, the you know he does denounce the love of domineering here and he very much denounces the love of domination and tyrannizing here those ugly passions are what he identifies as the main things that are causing slavery and causing it to persist. Um, but I, but it is true that in the wealth of nations, you don't get the same kind of moral condemnation you got here. And this moral condem condemnation from 1759 was quoted repeatedly in the early anti-slave literature, slavery literature. And so I do think it had a real effect. Just on mute. Um, so, in other words, uh, basically, the critics who who argue that well, Adam Smith, you know, he was only against slavery because he argued that it was uneconomic, that you had to force people to work, and they 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 didn't do they didn't do as diligent a job as somebody who was actually earning from that. So, really, they should actually read a lot more <laughs> of Adam Smith just by focusing on the wealth of nations. They've actually missed out on on his moral argument. Yes, I, I feel so that so. I mean, Smith's general treatment of slavery is, is much broader if you go to everything else. And he talks about the, in a sense, the original um, abolition of slavery in this corner of the world, in, in the North, you know, in, in Europe. And he's continuing that same moral spirit, fighting the reemergence of slavery now among. Uh, um, among people from Europe, especially as it exists in the in the New World, and so he's just continuing this moral, this I would say this long moral arc uh, to to fight um, this new emergence. Um, and then you got to realize that you got to persuade the people, you got to persuade aristocrats, and telling them how heinous they've been in per, uh, uh, perpetrating slavery and slaveholding, it's not, it's not the greatest way to get the other people at the side of the table to rethink their position. If you condemn people morally, it may be less um, effective than saying, hey, come on, isn't this even better for you and better for everyone else. And come on, rather than, you know, just a straight moral condemnation, which he did deliver in his original remarks. <laughs>
yeah, as, as you said of the brewer and the, the baker uh, example, you speak to them of their own interests. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, thank you, Daniel. Um, uh, let me bring in Craig now. Um, uh, Craig, uh, critics of uh, Adam Smith uh, um, all over the place, but uh, in particular, it seems in your home of Scotland, uh, see Adam Smith as being the uh, father of a, a ruthless capitalism, uh, which in turn uh, sees him as the uh, a driver of, of imperialism, uh, since that was a a ruthless capitalist exercise, um, or are they misreading? Are they maligning him? I, I think they are maligning him in this case. Um, and I think that it, it, it's the result of a kind of mistake because many of the, the criticisms of Smith along this line um, are the product of a theory that links something called capitalism to something called imperialism, um, two concepts developed after Smith's time um, in a Marxian tradition. Um, and I think the problem with that assessment of Smith um, through that, or assessing Smith through that lens, is that um, it, it mistakes and in fact obscures one of the central things about Smith's case um, uh, for markets and for free trade. And that is the fact that these arguments are made by Smith explicitly against the target of imperialism against the mercantile system that he saw developing in the nascent British empire around about him in the 18th century. Smith was the most radical um, critic of British imperialism in the 18th century that you will find. And his criticism is moral. Um, it is political in the sense that he believed that the British were really fooling themselves if they thought that they were um, creating this powerful empire across the seas when in reality, all they were doing was um, expending vast amounts of money on the defense of colonies. It was economic in the sense that he believed that um, colonies themselves were an inefficient way to, to, to organize um, the economics of a country. Um, in particular, um, he was able to, to, to develop a series of arguments which were to demonstrate that um, the, the, the very ideas that were being put forward by those in favor of Britain's colonial empires and in favor of mercantile restrictions um, in the trade between Britain and the colonies, he was able to demonstrate that those um, policies actually actively harmed Britain. That is to say that the wealth, the, the wealth of Britain was harmed by the colonial uh, enterprise. Now, that's, that, that type of argument goes against the analysis of those in this Marxian tradition that, as, that associates Smith with capitalism and imperialism. And it's important, I think, to understand why he makes that argument. He makes that argument because he believes that colonialism always misdirects capital and economic activity. And he makes a very good example of this in talking about the relationship between Britain and our North American colonies in the 18th century. He talks about how that trade has swollen to a huge level between Britain and North America. And he could see that in the Glasgow of his time with the various tobacco merchants who were trading with the Virginia colonies. And Smith's point was that absent the colonial empire, absent the restrictions on transport between Britain and the colonies and the monopolies of trade with those um, colonies, Britain's economic activity would have diversified around a range of other potential trading partners. So there was a real danger that in narrowing Britain's trade to its colonial um, possessions, that, that Britain was actively um, harming its own economic interests by cutting off potentially lucrative trades with other parts of the world. And so Smith is very clear that this is a mistaken view. And he's pragmatic in his view about what we should do about this. He thinks that it would be far better if um, there were universal international free trade rather than trade with the colonies. But he accepts that that's a political argument that he has to make. And indeed the wealth of nations as a book is him making precisely that political anti-imperial argument. It's a book written explicitly to persuade the British political class to give up on the idea of a British empire. But more than that, he's even more damning about other forms of imperialism. And here's where I think the critics of colonialism and imperialism are missing a trick. 
Smith's criticism of empire and colonies is better than Marx's criticism of empire and colonies because it's not attached to a monolithic theory that everything has to be crammed into. Smith can look at the examples of different colonies and different forms of colonial exploitation and assess the, the various evils that go with them. And indeed, that's what he does in the Wealth of Nations. He looks at Britain's American colonies and says what's wrong with that trade, but he also looks at the activities of the East India Company and explains how a very different set of problems and evils arise out of the conditions created by the East India Company, particularly in Bengal. So what you get from Smith is, is a kind of pragmatism and a willingness to look at different examples of imperialism and see precisely the problems that are brought about by that form of, um, of, of relationship between um, countries. Mm. Uh, I mean, what then would Adam Smith regard as, as being, apart from just free trade, I mean, what would he regard as being a good international order or a, a good political arrangement if it wasn't imperialism? Um, I think many of the things that he describes in, in, the, in the Wealth of Nations, when he talks about the conditions that allow people um, to, to, to trade with each other and to, to bring about economic development, a stable legal system, um, a stable political order, um, peace brought about through trade between nations, um, the absence of this um, desire that, 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 that Dan mentioned to, to domineer over other people, whether within your country or in other countries. And I think that, that, that would be the kind of order he's looking at. And the interesting thing I find about this is that often the case for, for Smith being implicit in uh, capitalism and imperialism is, is made by people saying that he, he lived before the, the horrors of 19th century industrialization and 19th century um, British imperialism, red tooth and claw. And that's right, he did. Um, but he criticized it before that happened. He explained why Britain shouldn't go down that route. And he was sufficiently modest to admit that he doubted whether his arguments, as powerful and as persuasive as they were, would go up against the interests of those who sought to persuade the British political order to act in their interests. So, you know, he 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 actually saw um, to a certain extent that he wasn't he wasn't going to be as successful as he hoped he was going to be in making the anti-imperial case. Hmm. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, while we're getting the uh, other panelists back on screen, uh, let me just say that uh, we welcome questions from our viewers and listeners. Um, there is a Q&A tag just at the bottom of your screen. So if you click that, you can uh, put a question to our panel. Um, so uh, let me just uh, say, say to the panel, um, from what you've all been saying, I mean, Adam Smith comes over as much more modern and more radical than people might give him credit for. And people sort of think of him as being an old 18th century, uh, stuffy sort of person, but in fact, you're all you're all basically saying that his his views were really quite radical and revolutionary for the time. Is, it, is that right? Who'd like to go first? I could speak. Um, yeah, I really think that um, he was exploring human nature and uh, understood in a way that would persist. 300 years after him. And so he's talking about creatures, us, uh, in such a general way that what he does, he does it so I think successfully that what he does, says remains timely, just as you say, um, and pertinent. Yeah, and that's true of his moral thinking as well. I mean, it was revolutionary, wasn't it, Humana, at the time? I mean, it was uh it yeah. sort of thought oh it came from god or or whatever but 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 he was saying no it's part of our nature as human beings yes i think he is radical and revolutionary and that uh, push it a bit more and say it still is actually uh because uh as you were all saying he had he has this very strong criticisms and i don't think he uh, kind of, th there was a question there that he sacrifices his principles or his theory for practical um, effect. Actually, I think he's being coherent and uh, with what he stated as his theory, 
as his explanation of human nature and of what he sees is going on around him. There's a lot, lots of things that were happening at that time with which we can also identify that, and these are the conversations we're still having. And in that sense, he, as Daniel said, he's timely. And as, uh, as Craig said, he is a very hard critic of what he's seeing. And at the same time, he's optimistic, I believe. And I think he's, uh, someone called him recently, a true friend uh, of uh, capitalism, if we use that anachronic term for his times. And he's a true friend of uh, what he would say commercial society. Uh, just because he's telling us what are the good things about it and also what are the risks and the threats and how we should be prepared for it. So this idea uh, that Craig has worked on a lot about the politics of Adam Smith, on which we have uh, less uh, explicit messages from him, let's say, uh, are still very potent today in that sense that he's making us ask ourselves all the time, uh, where do we want to go? What do we want to do? How do we communicate with each other, even if we find it really demanding and if we do not want to hear what others have to say? He's pushing us to hear what others have to say all the time. And uh, politically very radical too, uh, Craig, really. And he, he must have been very unpopular in certain places at the time. I, I think he, he must have been. And I think one of the things that I find fascinating about this is that, you know, during his time in Glasgow, um, the people that he was um, socialising with were enriching themselves through um, the colonial trade with Virginia and with the Caribbean. Um, so he wrote a book that basically condemned um, the, the financial model of some of his closest friends. And that's a very interesting and in some respects a very brief thing to do. Um, the vested interests that Smith was taking on, both in politics and in economics at that time, were very, very powerful and influential people. And um, he is, he, he's, he's not sparing in his criticism of them um, in any way. And he's not sparing in his criticism of um, politicians who allow themselves to be as he would see it, fooled by the self-interested arguments of merchants involved in the imperial trade. Um, and you know, the, the hope is that the book, you know, to, 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 to link into him and his comment there about optimism, the hope is that people would read The Wealth of Nations and say, no, hang on a minute. We're, someone, someone's trying to fool us. Someone has created a, a, a story in our politics um, about this vast, powerful empire that exists over the seas and enriches everybody in Britain, that's simply not true. Um, and that it enriches a very small group of um, plantation owners and nabobs and tobacco merchants, but actually another alternative model of how Britain should trade with the rest of the world would be far more enriching um, for the rest of the population. It always actually surprises me how, of course, his young tutor was the, sorry, his young student was the Duke of Buccleuch, the young Duke of Buccleuch, with whom he had a, uh, a lifelong friendship. Uh, and yes, you read the, the Wealth of Nations and it talks about landowners in the, in the most scathing terms. And I just wonder how the poor Duke of Buccleuch uh, must, must have reacted to this. Uh, but, uh, but there you go. Um, it gives more abuse to merchants, however. Oh, yes. It yeah. does. Yes. It does. And uh, the, you know, the uh, conspiracy against the public when they meet together, even for merriment and diversion. Mm -hmm. uh, although he says that that's brought on by governments, really. It's government regulations and things like that, which, which mm -hmm. make merchants, if you like, uh, act in a political way rather than in a business way. So, mm -hmm. All right. Can I just underscore Craig's comments by quoting the last words of the Wealth of Nations? He's talking about international, the empire, essentially, and he ends the book by suggesting that Great Britain should endeavor to accommodate her future views and designs to the real mediocrity of her circumstances. So it's kind of a, come on, give up this fantasy uh, and and and. and maybe passion towards uh, thinking of yourself as dominating other people and 
be happy with the real mediocrity of your circumstances. Uh, we've had a few uh, questions in. Now, some of these questions are things like, you know, uh, what would Adam Smith have thought about the European Union? And I'm going to reject uh, these, these questions because we can't possibly know. It's uh, when, uh, when we started doing our publications, I always used to put a quote in from Adam Smith in, in the frontispiece on the subject. But then we, when you start talking about the state pensions or whether we should have a new London airport, <laughs> Adam Smith didn't say anything about that. So we can't really uh, judge these things. But here's an interesting one, um, which is that, uh, as an, uh, from uh, Tabani uh, Maposa, and he says, as an African and black individual, uh, we need to tread carefully and avoid sensationalizing Smith's words about the non-economic aspects of slavery. He talked to slave owners and imperialists, so he couldn't connect with them based on empathy. It had to be economics. Um, so, is that right? Is that what Adam Smith was doing with his, uh, you know, the, the, the famous dif, 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 uh, attack on slavery as being non-economic and, and his criticisms of empire and so on? Yeah. Uh, Craig, do you want to go? Yeah, I, I was just going to say, I, I think that's absolutely what he's doing. You have to, as Dan said, you have to have a rhetorical technique that will persuade your audience. And if Smith's audience were people who thought they were going to make money out of slavery, then Smith had to work out a way to persuade them that that was not the case, um, in addition to the moral condemnation. And the interesting thing about empire in particular is that almost everybody, um, almost every educated person um, at the time Smith was writing had been given the political reasons that Britain shouldn't have an empire because they'd all been educated with the story of Rome and the corruption of the Republic and the, the rise of the empire and how that story ended badly. So there was a political argument there and there was a moral argument there, but what there wasn't was an economic argument. And that's what Smith came along with. And that was far, far more powerful because the vested interests who might ignore the political and moral arguments if they could really couldn't ignore an economic argument that explained to them why they weren't actually enriching themselves as much as they could. Yes. So, I, I mean, I have to actually just try and if I could just stay on that for just one moment. Uh, we actually have a, a question in for, from Twitter and uh, thank you to everybody on Twitter or, or, or any other medium that's sending in questions. Um, uh, and they ask, so did em imperial preference uh, benefit our colonies even if it was at Britain's loss, and would the colonies have been worse off under free trade? Greg. Um, and again, Smith is quite, um, he's, he's quite pragmatic about this. He says that it's possibly the case that opening up trade routes and establishing colonies might be something which provides an initial benefit for providing or facilitating trade between countries. Um, but that very, that very quickly falls away. Um, so I think his, his longer term answer to that is that um, it would have been better had individuals been left free to trade with other individuals from other places um, without any of the kind of um, strictures or indeed encouragements um, to direct their trading activity um, mm -hmm. towards particular markets. Um, I have a small point I want to add. Him yeah, did you want to add something? No. Okay. Um, the point I wanted to add was, it's important, it's imp with the, he's living in an age of democracy in these years. And that has to be thought about when you think about who he needs to persuade. In a democracy, making the moral argument and persuading a majority of just general readers um, is powerful. And it's the what we're used to now because we have a democratic ethos. But when it's a smaller group of governors, essentially, um, people with political power, um, just, the, you know, that's one reason why you have to appeal to them in terms of their own interests so much. That's the only point I wanted to make. It's, it wasn't the age of democracy then. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, so communities are actually quite strong, Jimena, is that right? And you, you, you've yeah. talked to each one on its own term. <laughs> I, well, there, there's, 
And I think this connects well with what uh, Craig and Daniel were saying about uh, persuasion and rhetorics, because uh, there is a strategy as to how and who you have to convince about what. And so you have to be uh, just aware of where you're talking, what you're talking about and who you're talking to. And Smith is quite an expert on this, actually. And um, uh, as you uh, reminded us, Eamon, at the beginning of the webinar, uh, he was well known for his uh, rhetoric lectures. And he was uh, searched out for these rhetoric lectures, which was uh, something that uh, well made his uh, fame at a point. And this idea of persuasion means that uh, this process of building a community uh, is is powerful in that sense that you can always and you should try to address the other's interests if you want to be persuasive. And that does not mean that you have con to concede, but that you are opening up to this dialogue and this communication that might be very demanding again. So I think what he's saying is a point that Daniel made before is about the the our ability to communicate with whoever we can see. And it's not that we communicate because we are all equal in our abilities and communications and interests, but because we're different and we can understand those differences because this, there's something basic about universality of our ability to communicate. But this we learn with others. So there are principles of the mind as, as he would call them or tendencies of human nature that when we come into society and as we grow up, we develop. And that development is crucial for us to become part of something or to change things. But things should be changed through this persuasive exercise. I think that's a very powerful uh, message today, actually. Thank you. And, um... Uh, let me just uh, return to my favorite uh, subject, which is statues, since I um, commissioned the statue of Adam Smith in Edinburgh. Uh, Shona McKechnie, uh, also from Scotland, uh, says uh, Trevor Phillips, who is the former chair of the uh, Equality uh, Commission here in, in the UK, um, gave a defense yesterday in support of important historical figures who may have had statues erected for them in a previous age. Uh, he reasoned that academics need to respond and repost uh, to the cancel culture by simple and robust uh, messaging. And Charlie Sherwood uh, writes in to say, what can be done to co correct the false narrative that Adam Smith was some sort of racist that needs to be canceled? So is this a problem for academics or is it a wider problem for the rest of us that we need to get these things right? Um, say both. <laughs> um, go ahead, Hemana, do you wanna elaborate? No, actually that, that's, that's it because I do think that um, that we get we there's this huge competition for people's attention right and we're getting all these messages and so we do have i think a task as academics to uh participate in this public debate and i think that's what we're doing right now like uh, getting out the message and uh it's it's not like preaching either it's just let's talk and understand and uh know what we're talking about and you cannot condemn something when you do not have enough information that's it you have to know and then make uh, a position and take a stand but first inform yourself and i think that's our role informing and uh, trying to make these messages robust and clear again in adam smith's lines we have to persuade that that should be our job mm -hmm. Anyone else want to come in? Um, if not, um, uh, here's one from Jane Bloomfield. I'm interested in any comments about how Smith has been used in the modern formulation of capitalism in neoliberal theory. Um, in particular, the, the reliance of Smith's, on Smith's self-interest theory and how this has been interpreted, uh, used correctly or incorrectly in uh, modern uh, liberal thought. 
liberal in the European sense. Um, who'd like to go on that one? I can speak to that one. Yeah, okay. Um, I think that Smith tends to show how vague the term self-interest is. He does use it sometimes. Um, and, and of course, I'm, you know, when, when we have some narrow sense of the situation and what the interests of someone going into a baker shop is to you know, obtain his bread at the lowest price he can find it, um, that makes perfect sense. But I think that the general, a general tendency of this book, and not this one, this one in particular, is um, to show the complexity of our interests and how once we develop our identity again and so forth and our projects in be be benevolent and beneficent projects, those become our self-interest. Our family, is that self-interest or is it love of your family and a kind of kindness, your friends? How are you going to be effective in being benevolent? It's going to be by sort of learning about the people you're trying to help and in a sense, befriending them but think about it. Now you're back to helping your friends. So I think there's a tendency for Smith to kind of show the complexity of self-interest in this, in this work. Um, so the idea of, of kind of a narrow, well-defined self-interest, I don't think actually is part of classical liberal theory at all. I think that's something of a caricature that opponents actually put on it. Hmm. Um, anybody else like to come in on that one? No, I just, I'd, I'd agree with, with, with what Dan was saying there and, and maybe even take it a little bit further that it's, given what we've just heard from, from him and there, we, we must realise that that's not just a, a, a mischaracterization of Smith, but a very radical mistake to make about Adam Smith. Um, this is a man who is, is deeply humane and deeply interested in explaining what human beings mean to each other and how they interact with each other. And, you know, the idea that you can abstract from that the notion of a self-interested, um, rational utility maximizer just strikes me as, you know, as bizarre. Well, I mean, uh, as people often say, and I think that, uh, wrongly, I think, but are there two Adam Smiths? Is there a sort of moral Adam Smith and a... Um, a self-interest Adam Smith? Then we're all going to have to say no. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's not. <laughs> there's one Adam Smith. And uh, because precisely what Daniel was saying, the complexity of self-interest and the, the complexity of interactions of uh, building ourselves with others who are changing all the time. Yes. Well, uh, uh, here in the UK, our Prime Minister rather unhelpfully the other day um, said to his colleagues, uh, of course, we owe our success with the uh, producing vaccines to uh, capitalism, to greed. And of course, capitalism isn't about greed, is it? And self-interest isn't about greed. So it may, it may, maybe you could enlighten us on the difference between greed and self-interest. Well, actually, there's, let, let me turn to Spanish because uh, actually Adam Smith was never com translated completely. Uh, in the 18th, and it, we have we had to wait a long time, and we read him in French first in Latin America, and so uh, this was a French version of Adam Smith. And then when it was got translated into Spanish, uh, especially the quote about the butcher and the brewer uh, did not say self-interest; it said egoism, and so there was a yes. big discussion about, uh, well, this horrible person that thinks we're all like these egoist people and that we cannot communicate with each other and that we only think about ourselves. And I think that had an important influence on how we viewed Adam Smith in Latin America, but also on this general idea of its uh, egoism that makes capitalism work. Mm. And then when you uh, start actually going into Adam Smith and reading Adam Smith and you see that this just does not fit. That if you go a little deeper into what he was saying, even with this mistake in translation, it's just not coherent. It, it just does not make sense to think that he could describe people as being driven by egoism and pay so much attention 
to how we interact and how we communicate and how we build communities and how these processes of putting ourselves through imagination in the place of someone else and asking ourselves, what would I feel? What would I do? How would I react in that situation? It, there's something that's, that's missing in the image that we have uh, on Smith, I think. And uh, someone uh, called Sarah, whose second name is in Spanish and I can't pronounce it, says, uh, what impact would that mistaken translation have in understanding Adam Smith among academics, like even today, as, as it influenced, and maybe in France too, perhaps? Uh, has it influenced uh, the way academics think about Smith today? Yes, I think it has. Actually, uh, there has been a great discussion uh, and there was a great discussion during the 19th century, precisely after independence. And we were building these new republics and we were stating the fact that we could be independent and free and prosperous. So people were looking for um, uh, like inspiration all over. And so uh, a lot of these authors from the Enlightenment and from the Scottish Enlightenment were, were read in Latin America, uh, as I say, especially in French. But that made Adam Smith like disappear because he was seen as this horrible person that presents us as all uh, incapable of caring for each other. And this in Latin America was seen as contrary to the possibility of a modern citizenship because a modern citizenship would mean uh, not only that we can decide for ourselves and be free and responsible, but that we could be, um, that there would be some sort of what Smith would call fellow feeling. But that did not get translated, right? So we did not get that part of Smith. And so uh, what we had was uh, influence of others and we translated and we adopted and we produced our own theories, social theories using other things that when in the 20th century we have been discussing in Smith again, have been uh, like rediscovered. So there has been, I think, but I think this, has, this, is, this is not only in Latin America, there has been a rediscovery of Adam Smith. Uh, and, and maybe uh, Daniel or, or Craig might uh, an answer this. I, I mean, how big an impact did Smith's writings have at the time on what I think he called practical men, or certainly Keynes called them practical men, on you know on 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 politicians and so on. Um, did did all these guys read Adam Smith? Did they understand Adam Smith? Did they just take bits of Adam Smith, or did they get the whole picture? Yeah, I mean, I I, I think um, they certainly read him. Um, they they certainly saw that he was someone who could be quoted as an authority. And you see him being quoted in parliament and lauded by politicians, um, you know, prime ministers and, and, and influential people seeing the power of his arguments. Um, but then as Smith himself acknowledged, as I mentioned earlier, he recognized that those people were also working with constraints about what they could do and who they could persuade. Um, so there was always a disconnection between the, the kind of rhetoric of the success of Smith's influence, but also the other interests, the interests of the merchants that he was attempting to counter were also powerful political forces um, in the Britain of his time. Um, but, it, but his ideas certainly were, were widely discussed and they certainly were um, influential in shaping the way people talked about um, these issues, if not always successful in, in shifting, um, shifting the institutions uh, towards his his favored um, policies. Let me just add that what Craig just said, I think is very true, but it's mainly about this. Yeah. It's mainly about the wealth of nations um, and that this actually fell into oblivion after Smith's death mm. and was highly, highly forgotten. And in a sense, not really rediscovered until the end of the 20th century. Meanwhile, Smith said that he thought this was the superior book. So the whole human contact, sentiment, sympathy, 
that whole side of him was sort of lost while people focused on this. And although I do think there's only one Adam Smith, I do think there's a huge difference in style between these two books, but it's just different perspectives on the same human questions, I think. Well, here's an interesting question from uh, Edwin Earhart, which is uh, basically, um, everybody knows their Marx, Lenin, Stalin, and Mao, certainly among uh, cancel culture, um, and they're not open to any discussion, but um, doesn't our talk about Adam Smith just fall on, on deaf, e deaf ears? It, it doesn't seem to be influencing anybody, or, or am I wrong? I mean, uh, are we more successful than we think? And another question is, is Adam Smith someone who uh, you, can, you can find something to justify anything, any argument you want? You can bend him uh, to, to your own argument. What do you think about <laughs> those rather impish yeah. questions? Um, I think he, could, he can be bent in all kinds of directions, particularly when you're talking about specific modern issues where he doesn't actually explicitly say precisely what he thinks about it. Um, but I think there's only so far you can bend him. And, and bending him to say that he advocated slavery and was complicit in it is, is very difficult to do um, when you look at the things he actually wrote. Um, and I think that that's the problem with, with this particular episode in what you might call cancel culture, is that it's, it's essentially, um, its criticism of Smith is based um, on a completely uh, untenable position. Uh, here's, here's another one, maybe the last or second last, uh, from uh, Tim Ambler. Um, he says, was Smith bo bothered by inequality? Um, the envy and resentment of the poor uh, by the poor of the rich um, and the security or the social issues that might arise. From that, so uh, you know, we 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 think of Smith as being you know free market, and uh, you you survive on your own wits in a free market, I guess. Um, so was he worried about the inequality that might uh, come from that? I can speak to that, but do you want to, Jimena? Go ahead. Um, he talks of the poor and poverty very, very often, uh, well, in, I guess you could say in both works, but especially in The Wealth of Nations. And Chris Martin has done a wonderful research showing that, um, first of all, he does, he's very concerned about the poor. He is highly motivated and oriented to say what's going on with the people who are worse off and why. Um, let me also just say that he's, he's also advancing a kind of moral outlook where everyone counts equally which in that age was still fairly controversial and radical. Um, so when he looks at all the issues and when Chris Martin looks at all of the, you know, mentions of the poor, of workers and so on, um, he generally, quite consistently, when it's a policy issue, he talks in favor of markets, freer markets, helping the poor. And so it's kind of a allow them to find their way to take advantage of their skills and opportunities and ingenuity, um, open up markets, cut down privileges, which keep them out, make them outsiders. Um, and that's really quite consistent. Um, so I think concern for the poor, condition of the poor is central to his case for commercial society. By and large, though, it's it's sort of a rising tide raises all boats argument, which comes even at the very beginning of the book. Um, so those are those are my thoughts. Um, we're reaching the top of the hour, so uh, I've, I've got dozens of questions which we can't possibly uh, uh, cover. But I just wondered if um, uh, the three of you might uh, sort of sum up just very briefly in a minute or so, and, uh, and say, uh, what do you think Adam Smith's greatest contributions, greatest legacy to the, the modern age is? You know, we've, we've discussed what he was and what he thought, but what should we take most from him today? Jimena, do you, do you want to start on that one? I'd say this 
notion of an extended self, of the impossibility of being truly human in isolation. And that can be physical isolation or self-isolation of any other kind. And how Smith uh, calls upon us to enlarge our circles and open to communication again. Not accepting, I think, that this human communication is possible would be, I believe, the equivalent of dehumanizing those who are not like us and who are not visible. And I just cannot imagine anything more violent or contrary to human dignity. So as hard and shocking as this communication might be, I think Smith's invitation is to engage in it because it's what makes us human. Hmm. Uh, Daniel, what's what would you put as his greatest uh, legacy? Uh, it's such a huge question, but let me just accentuate something which is maybe a little bit not expected. To, that we take responsibility for our sentiments, hmm. that our sentiments are objects for us to estimate and consider rethinking and retraining uh, and reconsidering. Um, because I think in Smith, actually, everything that we can think about ourselves becomes sort of a question of, am I doing it properly? Is it proper for me to be like that? So the idea that there is, in a sense, choice or responsibility above feeling and sentiment, I associate with Smith. Hmm. Greg? Um, I would say, well, um, I should say two answers to this. One is what I think is as good as legacy is, and one is what I think it should be. Um, what I th what I think it is is a is a kind of um, pragmatic, skeptical, empirical attitude to everything that he looks at, and I think that that's you know I think that's a a clear legacy that he's left. Um, you can see it in in how the social sciences develop after Smith's time, and I think his clear-eyed approach has, has, has given that. Um, what do I think it should be? I think it should probably be um, the theory of moral sentiments, which has been overlooked as, as we've discussed um, this evening for, for far too long, because I think it is the, the most penetrating and the most humane description of what it is to be a human being trying to make decisions about what the right thing to do is, as, as Dan was just describing there. Mm. I, I think that's actually a very good uh, note to to wind up on. Uh, that yeah, let let's start reading reading the uh, theory of moral sentiments uh, again. I think I have to say that it's better if you don't read it in the straightforward order, <laughs> and you're probably better to dive into the middle and then start at the beginning again. Uh, but um, uh, because it is a, a strangely lumbering sort of book, but it's a fantastic book. And it, I think it teaches us much more about Adam Smith than, uh, uh, than, than people understand. So uh, let me uh, thank everyone. Uh, let me thank uh, Jimena Hurtado, Daniel Klein, and uh, Craig Smith, our speakers and Smith experts. If you'd like to know more about Adam Smith, you'll find plenty on the Adam Smith Institute uh, website, adamsmith.org. Um, including our own uh, Condensed Wealth of Nations, which is free to download and uh, saves you reading 950 pages of the Wealth of Nations and goodness knows how many of uh, Theory of Moral Sentiments. Uh, so thanks again uh, to our, our panelists and thank you all for joining. Thanks for all of our supporters who've uh, joined in our uh, fight to uh, tackle this uh, cancel, cancel culture that's broken out in uh, Edinburgh. We, we thank you very much for your support in that. And please uh, join us uh, at the same time next week for another Adam Smith Institute webinar on things that matter. Thank you very much. <laughs>